Dr. Sonia Mather is a member of our board of directors. She is a person with Parkinson's, a former family physician, and she has been living with Parkinson's for over 20 years, and she moderates many of our webinars, and we love her so much. Thank you so much for being here. I'm going to let you take it from here. Thank you, Mel. Good afternoon, everyone. As Mel mentioned, my name is Dr. Sonia Mather. I am a family physician, and I've also been living with the challenges that you've been living with for well over 22 years now. And I do have the privilege of serving on the board of directors for the foundation, and I also have the very great pleasure of being your moderator today. Today, the topic of our webinar is sleep and living well with Parkinson's disease. Sleep is definitely part of living well with this disease. It's part of our daily routine, an opportunity for us to rest our bodies, to find some relief from the motor symptoms of this disease. One of the few times that we can eat, actually feel our muscles relax or stop tremoring. Yet sleep disorders, unfortunately, are fairly common non-motor symptom that can really affect our quality of life. So joining us today to explore this topic further is Dr. Ron Pastuma. Dr. Pastuma is a professor at the Department of Neurology and Neurosurgery, Faculty of Medicine at McGill University in Montreal, Canada, fellow Canadian. He is a clinical researcher and movement disorder specialist with an interest in a variety of aspects of Parkinson's, including early detection and prevention of Parkinson's and testing new treatments for non-motor symptoms such as sleep disorder. He also holds a master's in epidemiology. Thank you for joining us today. Pleasure. So to start off the discussion, um, perhaps we can define how much of a problem sleep disorders are in Parkinson's disease. How, how common is it? Very common. Uh, so not every sleep disorder is the same, right? And in fact, they're often opposite of each other. Uh, but if you sort of look at the whole course of Parkinson's disease over your life, uh, the chances that you'll develop one of the sleep issues related to Parkinson's are on the order of 90%. If, if you look cross-sectionally, so everyone say with Parkinson's right now, uh, maybe about half to two thirds of people are experiencing some issue with their sleep. So it's really quite a common problem. And why exactly is sleep disrupted in Parkinson's disease? What's, what's happening in our brains that would cause that? Right. So there's a, there's a lot of things. Uh, the most, uh, sometimes when I give a talk, I actually show a, a map of where Parkinson's is in one half, and I show a map of all the areas that control sleep in the other half. And what you can see is that, you know, whereas we often think of Parkinson's disease, oh, it's this dopamine disease. In fact, it, that, that is not a dopamine disease at all. It just happens to be the way that we, we, we identify it. In fact, it has a, a lot of areas of the brain uh, that are, are down in what we call the brainstem area that control things like sleep and mood and, and all these sorts of, uh, of, of aspects. Uh, in addition to the motor aspects, those are affected in Parkinson's disease as well. And so if you look at the map of things that control sleep and you look at the map of things that, that uh, of Parkinson's, it, they, they overlap a lot. And in fact, so most of the sleep problems that we're having are really related to, directly related to the Parkinson's disease. That's one. Number two, the dopamine state uh, can make things a little bit worse as well. Uh, and so that's one of the commonest things we do for insomnia. We'll get into that later, I think. Uh, number three, the medications can affect sleep, particularly via sleepiness most of the time. Mm -hmm. Really, the biggest one is the number one. It's, it's just a disease that affects the sleep centers. But the other things can play a role as well. Now, is that why we find that uh, the dopamine state kind of affects sleep? Like one of our listener says that when they get into bed at the first, their hand tremor persists and annoys them. And then they put it in a novel position or hang it off the edge of the bed and they're able to relax enough to fall asleep. Um, and they're just wondering, is, is the natural ebb and flow of dopamine and what it does play a part in the sleep cycle? Yeah, definitely. So it's not hard to imagine that if you're having bad Parkinson's symptoms, you won't be able to sleep. So tremor is one, you know, it's thumping against your chest. How can you sleep with it thumping against your chest like that? Uh, the, the other one is discomfort or pain or restlessness, which can often be symptoms that when the dopamine levels are a little bit low, you have it. An interesting thing about sleep is that, uh, and Parkinson's, is that from the motor standpoint, while you are asleep, you basically don't really have Parkinson's and uh, your motor state is, is, is non-functional. Non and the reason for that is, is Parkinson's is essentially, in terms of the motor problems, it's like there's a whole loop that we have that tells us whether to move or not. And when you have Parkinson's disease, you've got a problem with that loop. And in fact, it's just telling your whole brain and body, not, don't move, don't move. This is 
you know, you, you're supposed to be standing still. Okay. Now it's not on a conscious level. It's all on a very subconscious cycle mm -hmm. sort of level. But when you're asleep, that whole system is asleep as well, in fact. And so basically during Parkinson's, during sleep, you kind of don't have motor Parkinson's. Mm. The difficulty, of course, is that all of us wake up all the time. Uh, 10 times an hour, people will wake up just for a few seconds, 10 seconds here, 20 seconds there. And then you wake yourself up and here comes a tremor, thump, thump, thump against your chest, woke you up fully instead of just having you drift back to sleep. So that's one of the ways that, that dopamine can really affect the Parkinson's sleep. So you've sort of gotten into the next sort of topic I was going to uh, ask you to explain and that sleep disorder sort of refers to a broad term. It's, it kind of encompasses different sleep issues that Parkinson's patients have. And so what are the different types of sleep disorders that we see in Parkinson's in terms of categories? Right. So really, I guess four. Uh, the first one is insomnia. Okay. And insomnia Almost always, if it's related to the Parkinson's, of course, everyone has insomnia now and again, but Parkinson's related insomnia is almost always, excuse me, a difficulty in uh, uh, staying asleep rather than falling asleep. Some people have difficulty falling asleep, of course, like everybody else, but if it's Parkinson's, it's usually staying asleep. The other one is sleepiness. Um, so excessive sleepiness during the day, okay? And usually, in fact, you think, oh, that's because I have insomnia. No, in fact, no. Uh, it's, it's usually, in fact, a separate problem. Uh, the other one is uh, called REM sleep behavior disorder. So we act out our dreams at night. We're supposed to be paralyzed when we dream. That's normal. Uh, but you lose the paralysis, you act out your dreams. Mm -hmm. And then the last one, which is kind of related to insomnia, would be restless legs, which can sometimes mm -hmm. happen usually later in, in Parkinson's uh, disease. So if we go back to the first one you mentioned, the insomnia, I know you said, I mean, there's lots of people that have trouble falling asleep in sort of the general population. But you mentioned in Parkinson's, it's a bit different. Do people with Parkinson's disease have trouble falling asleep or is it afterwards that they wake they up? They can, uh, but really, if you look at falling asleep troubles, it's the same as everybody else, okay? The classic Parkinson patient. Now, if you're, if you're a 30-year-old with Parkinson's, things are totally different. But if you're, you know, the average sort of, you're in your 50s, 60s, this sort of age, it's, oh, goodness, I can barely stay awake. It's, it's nine o'clock. I'm falling asleep in front of the TV. And then I'm awake at, uh, you know, one in the morning, two in the morning. I can't get back, back to sleep yet. Often people will notice that they have this pattern. It's nine o'clock at night and then they sleep for like four hours and then they can't sleep again. They get out of bed and two hours later they can sleep again. Uh, so that's a common pattern that we also see in Parkinson's disease. And we hear, um, I guess for the initial insomnia, we hear about something called sleep hygiene mm -hmm. as a method to help regulate our sleep-wake cycle. Could you explain what that means? And what yeah, so sleep hygiene is, is basically the series of things. It's often part of what we call cognitive behavioral therapy. It's just one part of it. So uh, this, this is the number one treatment for insomnia in people who don't have Parkinson's. It's way better than medications, okay? Mm -hmm. And the idea is to train yourself how to sleep. And there's a lot in it. Uh, but to basically summarize briefly, it's first of all, do a whole bunch of sleep hygiene things, which means don't do all the things that tend to keep you awake. Uh, and I must say, most of my Parkinson patients is pretty instinctive. They all kind of know this. So it's not, we're, most of our Parkinson's aren't going clubbing at four in the morning. You know, uh, we're not, you know, we're not uh, drinking coffee to two hours before bedtime. Some of it is so obvious. That's almost never the problem. The one sleep hygiene thing I do notice that Parkinson patients tend to make a mistake is the rule of sleep hygiene, uh, the rule of insomnia is if you can't stay in, if you can't sleep, don't stay in bed. What happens if you stay in bed is you start to associate the bed with this horrible torture chamber where I lie awake for hours and hours unable to sleep. And then you de develop an association and when that association goes, uh, comes, then you basically can't sleep at all. And one of the paradoxes of, of insomnia, which drives every insomnia crazy, is you have to not think about falling asleep in order to fall asleep. Uh, and so if you're lying in bed thinking about it, it's just not going to work. And so if, if you have reasonable motor you know, state that you can get out of bed, if you're not you know, you know, too bed bound, for example, usually what I say is, okay, it's one in the morning, you're up now, go up, go read a book for an hour or two, uh, sit in front of a TV, hopefully not too bright. And then when you feel sleepy, go back again. And many people I find have that pattern that I just told you about, the four hours and the two hours and the two hours of extra. If that's who you are and it doesn't impair your life, just go with it um, rather than fighting it with medications and pills. So that's the big part of sleep hygiene that, that we need, really need to be aware of.
What are the other things that people should be looking for with sleep hygiene? You mentioned some of them are fairly common that we don't um, tend to uh, violate, I guess, but what are they? Right. In so keeping a relatively regular schedule, okay? So uh, this is a big problem with adolescents, of course, or people who work shifts or mm -hmm. weekends, uh, this sort of thing. So you try to go to bed at around whatever it is, 11 o'clock every night within an hour or two as much as possible, okay? Mm -hmm. Um, make sure uh, that you get uh, adequate exercise, particularly uh, if you have trouble falling asleep, you need to avoid exercise in the late afternoon. If you have no trouble, then that's no problem. Mm -hmm. uh, get good light exposure throughout the day. Actually, that's the biggest treatment for somnolence that probably you can just do on a daytime basis, but also probably helps insomnia, is that don't sit inside all day. Around mid-afternoon, at least, get outside, get sun on your face, and it helps reset your cycle. Um, Obviously, if the room is too noisy or too quiet or the bed is too hot or too cold or, you know, all these sorts of things, you know, mm -hmm. be aware of the things that make you unable to sleep. Just be aware of those and watch out for those. I mean, um, there's a list of 100 of these. You can get them off the Internet very easily, actually. Just sleep hygiene, insomnia, don't, and you'll, you'll see a list of like 50 things. Perfect. Is there anything that your Parkinson's physician can do? If say you've tried all these sleep hygiene methods and you're still having difficulty with your sleep, are there changes in your medication, for instance, that might be an issue or, or what other factors do you have to look at? Yeah, so if the sleep hygiene is not a big problem and the sleep is a problem and you can't just go with it, then we have to think about what we're gonna do medication wise usually. Okay. And so I, I have an order that I personally follow. I see lots of people with Parkinson's. The first thing I do is I make sure the dopamine system is okay. Uh, so if, if just like you talked about, you're stiff, you're sore, you can't turn, or even you don't always feel it. If you're a person who fluctuates and your medications last for four hours, and then you take your last pill at 10 p.m., and now you're awake at 2 in, in the morning and you can't sleep again, maybe all you need is another dose of your levodopa, for example, at 2 in the morning. That's one of the commonest things I will do. Uh, or I'll, I, you know, many standard Parkinson's regimens are three times a day before breakfast, before lunch, before dinner. And so maybe I'll say, okay, let's spread it out and let's add before bedtime as well, because you're having trouble sleeping. So that's the first thing I always do. If that's not a problem, um, then we have to think about other medications. And here is where it gets, excuse me, a little bit difficult because most people who don't have Parkinson's have trouble falling asleep. Okay, and so all the pharmaceutical companies have tried to design medications that whose whole job is to get into your system really, really fast, knock you asleep, keep you that way for a couple of hours, and then the natural rhythm takes over and everything's fine. But if you have a problem staying asleep, you've got the opposite problem. And there's not a lot of medications that are designed to do that. If I want to give you a medication to kind of knock you out, but to knock you out six hours from now, then it's going to also knock you out 16 hours from now when you're supposed to be up during the day. Mm -hmm. And so there's a series of, of a few medications that, that I will use. Uh, the one I use most commonly is the old antidepressant medications. That's just what they're called, the, what we call the sedating antidepressants. And mm -hmm. there's two of these. Uh, one of them is doxepin, and we've done a little trial on this. Uh, and another one is trazodone, which has not had a trial in Parkinson's disease, but it's been done, the Alzheimer's physicians use it all the time. Mm -hmm. And the idea here is we're not treating depression at all, but it turns out that when you get at low doses of these medications, they're kind of like, you know, how Benadryl puts you to sleep. They're kind of antihistamines mm -hmm. and they're very good for keeping sleep maintenance. So you have more efficient sleep, especially in the later part of the night. So that's usually my first line. If a person is depressed, uh, then I might use actual antidepressants. Uh, uh, but again, not the new ones, the old ones. Uh, the old ones, uh, which is, appear to be more sedating uh, than the other ones. Um, that's always what I do first. What about the medications that a lot of people hear about, the sort of PAM, the lorazepam, the clonazepam, that sometimes they will hear other people taking for their sleep? What about right. those medications? So the, the, the PAMs, you got to be a bit careful about because they're habit forming, okay? So uh, uh, lorazepam, for example. It's not, your system gets kind of used to it. It's like a thermostat. Uh, you know, and now your temperature is set to a certain amount of, of, of those PAM benzodiazepine medications every night. And so you just get used to it. Now you need it. Uh, and so it, it's, and then you end up chasing it. And so we try not to do that. Um, once in a while, probably okay. Uh, 
You see a lot of people using clonazepam, which is a medication also prescribed for anxiety. I stay away from that as much as possible uh, because mm -hmm. it, it has a 48 hour half-life. In other words, it's around in your system for days and days after you take mm -hmm. it. So it'll make you sleepy during the day. There's another class of agents that are kind of like that. They're called the benzodiazepine Agonist, and these are all the Z medications. So Zopaclone, Zopaclone, uh, you know, they have brand names like Lunesta. I, I, they're all different in, in different countries. These probably are a little less habit forming. Again, they do probably work for Parkinson's, so I will sometimes use them. Uh, but they're not, uh, you know, again, it's exactly the problem where they're, they've been designed to put you to sleep. And so they help a little bit less at keeping you asleep. Are there any other dangers besides addiction to these sleeping medications that? Well, essentially they can make you a little bit too sleepy. Um, so if you're up at too high of a dose, you can get sleepwalking behaviors. So this is a common classic on an airline. Uh, someone really, really wanted to sleep. So they took a whole bunch of the Z medications. And then what happens is you get hit some turbulence or if you're in a bed, you, you hear a, a dog barking and you partially wake up, you're half asleep awake and then you act all confused and do crazy things. Uh, so that's a, a common side effect of these medications. In general, they're not really very dangerous. I don't want to oversell them as being a problem. We use them all the time. Most of the time, it's perfectly fine. And discussing medications, Parkinson's medications themselves, are there any that are more prone to um, aggravate a sleep disorder? Right. Uh, you, can get, you can get funny things with the Parkinson's medications that are different in some people than the other. So mm -hmm. most of the time, most of the Parkinson patients tend to make you fall asleep. Mm -hmm. But there are some people for whom it will keep them awake. And so you might just want to keep an eye on that. And so you could just find out yourself. So, you know, I really can't sleep at night. Let me just hold my, you know, assuming I'm not very, very sick from Parkinson's, let's hold that bedtime pill and see what happens. Oh, my sleep is much worse. Okay, no, I needed it. Okay, or if my sleep gets better, then maybe that's a signal. So you, you know, an experiment for a night or two, if your doctor is okay with it, is is, is perfectly fine. Um, one medication to be aware of is selegiline, which is a medication I like and I use a lot. Uh, it, it has some amphetamines uh, in it. Uh, that can be a really good thing if you're too sleepy, but usually uh, that's the reason why I tend to prescribe it in the morning and at lunchtime. Uh, so it's all washed out by the evening. Right. And are there any natural supplements um, that you know of that may work that patients can try as well? So the classic one is melatonin. Uh, you can get that from all sorts of sources. You can buy it over the counter. Uh, there have been some studies on melatonin and the jury's out really on whether it works or not. I think it probably, if you push the doses pretty high, it does put some people to sleep for sure. Incidentally, mm -hmm. it also might work on the REM sleep behavior disorder, this other problem. Uh, but uh, when you look at the studies, they, it doesn't look like it does very much. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe part of the problem is, is that when you have Parkinson's disease, the system, your circadian system that melatonin is supposed to be targeting is in fact degenerating. That's one of the reasons that you're insomniac. And so maybe you just don't have the target for that medication. So it's okay to try. I, I, some people find it's useful. Uh, it's not very dangerous. It just makes you sleepy the next day if you take too much. Uh, so no problem with using it if, if you're otherwise well. Most of the time, it's not a big difference. I've, I've seen there's a real variability in terms of dosage for melatonin that you get over the counter. Is there any particular dose that you um, suggest patients start at? I typically go with three milligrams is my usual starting dose. Five, mm -hmm. maybe six six, if you two, three milligram pills, 10, don't go past there. There's been studies with 50. Uh, I'm, it's probably okay, but that's a lot. Um, if you have jet lag, and I use melatonin all the time for jet lag, it's a great treatment for jet lag. So I fly to Europe and I take the melatonin. I, you only need about half a milligram to get the full effect on your circadian cycle. Uh, and so when you're using these really high doses, you're basically forcing the system to kind of put you to sleep a little bit. It generally, it doesn't help very much to go on a higher dose. And when you get sleep from any of these medications that you've talked about, is it as good quality sleep as you could normally achieve if you, if you didn't have Parkinson's, I guess it would yeah, be. Yeah, so that's the thing that I don't really know. Uh, I mean, everyone, I travel internationally a lot, and so sometimes I'll use the, the, the Zopaclone kind of the Z medications. And I must say, the next day, I, I feel just as tired. I, it doesn't really seem to help me very much. In terms, like, I, I sleep, but I'm right. not sure. It, it, we don't have very good evidence on the restorative value of that sleep. And it's hard to measure because actually you can do a lot better without sleep than you think. 
um, you know, people can go without sleep and they think they're horrible, but in fact, they perform relatively well. Um, the, the sedating antidepressant medications that I mentioned earlier, so the transidone and the doxepin, they probably do improve the quality of your sleep. Uh, we've done some studies, uh, and they're very small. I don't want to oversell them, but, you know, for example, uh, you would think that maybe they'd make your cognition worse, but in this one little study that we did, the, the, the cognitive testing was actually better in those who were using it. So it was only six people. Don't take too much into it. So, but there's a sense that that is a more restorative kind of sleep. That brings up the question, how much sleep is enough, really? I mean, is it, is it, you go, you hear guidelines, eight hours of sleep is a necessity or, you know, but as you're saying, if you don't feel unwell from getting less sleep, is that the guideline that you use usually, or is there a certain amount? Yeah, that you yeah, yeah. Don't worry about it if you're not sleeping very much. In fact, one of the big things of sleep hygiene training is to teach you not to worry about it so much. Uh, you know, your body will ultimately get the sleep it needs. Now, it may not be at the time you want. You might find that you now need those early afternoon naps, whereas you didn't need them before. But, you know, if it fits with your lifestyle, just get it. Right. Count very carefully the hours that you're asleep if you think you're having trouble with insomnia insomnia. So I have many patients who say, oh, um, doctor, I can barely sleep. Well, what time do you go to bed? I fall asleep in front of the TV at eight o'clock and then I wake up at 2.30 and I can't sleep. Well, that's six and a half hours. That's the normal duration of sleep for a 65-year-old person. Right. Uh, you've just gotten your full night. Um, so, you know, when you get older, you definitely, most people sleep less. Uh, if you're anywhere above five hours and you feel fine, don't worry about it. Perfect. That's good to know. Um, Let's move on to maybe sleepiness, kind of mm -hmm. the opposite, but connected obviously to sleep disorders. That they, they talk about uh, excessive daytime sleepiness. What exactly is that? So basically what that means is you fall asleep when you don't want to be, and it's during the day, okay? Uh, and so there's a couple of, there's many, many patterns that people will get. Uh, so one of the commonest is, is a, a medication-induced sleepiness. So especially if you're taking really big doses of levodopa, say three times a day, I have many, many of my patients who say, I take the, the pill and half an hour later, I just have to sleep. I have a 20-minute sleep and then I'm okay. Uh, that's a very common pattern. Um, there's also the circadian rhythm shift, like, you know, the early to bed, early to rise, so the people falling asleep in front of the TV at 8 o'clock. Okay, that's a different type of sleepiness as well. Um, and then there's people, there's a lot of people who have general sleepiness are just generally sleeping, period. So we think, uh, like I mentioned earlier, I think, oh, it's because I had a bad sleep last night. That's why I'm sleepy today. But if you, in fact, look at people who are sleepy, they're sleeping 10, 12, 14 hours a day. It's an overall change in their sleep drive. And they, they sleep like a rock, but they just need tons of it. And is that due to the Parkinson's disease specifically, the way it's affecting the brain? It can be. And usually when it's, when it's due to the Parkinson's itself, it's usually a little later in the disease. So after you've had it for a few years, uh, for example, um, those who have memory troubles, for example, uh, cognitive memory troubles associated with Parkinson's, which tend to happen when you're old, they're all sleepy almost. Uh, you know, so it, it has to do with sort of a general brain issue when you're sleeping 14 hours a day. Okay. If, you're, if you've had Parkinson's for three hours and you're really, really sleepy all the time and you're cognitively perfect and you're relatively young, the, usually that's medications. Medication. And what other things could cause daytime sleepiness other than medications? Like um, I'm thinking along the lines of, of breathing problems and that sort of thing. Can people explain? Yeah. So there's always a question. So the, the sleep apnea comes up very often uh, when, when we talk about uh, sleepiness. And to what degree is it a problem in Parkinson's disease? And so sleep apnea means uh, you basically, uh, your, your airway gets blocked, you stop breathing, so your brain wakes you up. And this can happen 100 times, 200, 300 times a night. And in the general population, sort of people who don't have Parkinson's, that's a very common cause of sleepiness. Mm -hmm. What's weird about Parkinson's is that it doesn't appear to be a common cause of sleepiness at all in Parkinson's disease. Mm -hmm. And so, in fact, we, we've tried to look as many times as you know, people look again and again. They look at people who have apnea and people who don't. And the apneic people are no more sleepy than the people who are not. So it's really something strange about that. Now, it, you could spin a whole bunch of things, um, right? Of course, if you are, you know, uh, somewhat overweight, particularly if you have a lot of weight on your neck, if you have a lot of abdominal weight, which is most, 
which is not most Parkinson's patients, but there are definitely Parkinson's patients who are like that. Mm -hmm. And you've had apnea for maybe 40 years, and now you're sleepy and you got Parkinson's. Well, it has nothing to do with the Parkinson's. You've had apnea. Fix the apnea and you might get better. Okay, but if you are you know, relatively thin uh, and you've got Parkinson's and you're getting sleepy now and you're never a snorer and you never stop breathing, I don't think it's likely that apnea is playing a role. And what about what we hear, sleep attacks? What are these exactly and how common are they for? for right, um, so sleep attacks essentially means that people are falling asleep almost instantly. And this came up uh, a lot in a report a very long time ago, particularly with the dopamine agonist medications. So that's like the primapexol, the reticotine, the ropinerol, is when, when people particularly are starting those medications, the sleep system is, is very sensitive and they can fall asleep just like that in, in one second. Uh, mm -hmm. And this has obvious major implications if you're driving. Um, in reality, it's relatively uncommon to that, that it happens just like that. When you talk to people, most of the time they're saying, I felt a little sleepy, uh, I was fighting it, and then I fell asleep, okay? And so what I often, this has big implications for when you're driving. So if you are sleepy and you are driving and you have Parkinson's, your brain is not like another person's brain in terms of ability to fight sleep. You have to stop. You have to stop instantly. And even if that means pulling over at the side of a freeway, mm -hmm. I would probably rather do that than fight sleepiness while driving. Because if you're fighting the sleepiness, particularly if you're on uh, medications, you do not have the power to resist it. You will fall asleep without realizing it and you'll kill yourself or somebody else. So pull over, cat nap it for two minutes. Uh, usually that works. Uh, mm -hmm. And then just, or get out, run around and try again. If you feel sleepy, pull over again. And it, a lot of my patients who have this will say, I, okay, I'm not sleeping, I'm not driving in the first hour, say, after I take this pill, because I know I always get sleepy. Schedule mm -hmm. your day around times when you know you'll be well. That's great cautionary um, advice for sure, because you're right, it could really impact you in a very negative way if you were to continue driving like that. Um, one of the questions we got is, how can you tell the difference between excessive sleepy, daytime sleepiness, and just a regular fatigue that we get with Parkinson's. Is there a right. way to It's not, they can be mixed up with each other, okay? Mm -hmm. But probably the simplest way to tell, they're not the same thing at all, okay? First of all, mm -hmm. fatigue, the physical fatigue of Parkinson's disease and the sleepiness of Parkinson's disease should not be considered. So you can have both, but they're not the same thing, okay? Mm -hmm. and, and what I usually just ask is, if you sit quietly in a chair, do you instantly fall asleep? If you do, then you have so then you have somnolence. Okay, mm -hmm. if you're not actually falling asleep, then you're feeling sort of mental fatigue, physical fatigue, totally different phenomena. Right. Well, that makes sense. So, what can we do? What can we do as patients when we have this excessive daytime sleepiness? Is there anything that, that we can? So, do? Uh, I must say, this is one of the harder ones to fix. So what you can do is what I mentioned earlier, the, the bright light is probably, there's now a pretty good trial demonstrating that it can be useful. And this is particular if you're bed bound or at home all the time, uh, people in, in uh, long-term care facilities, they can often be very dark and very gloomy uh, places. What I would do then is I go buy one of those light boxes, you know, those are really, really bright, 10,000 lux light boxes. You get it for a hundred bucks, something like that. Uh, and you just have that around and you, sh you don't look into it directly. You just have it in the room. Uh, many, many times you, you just put that light box, say next to your book when you're reading and it's, it's shining like if, if you're sitting, you know, at this sort of distance or in front of you, this distance, just shining on the side of your face. Uh, mm -hmm. And that can help quite a bit. Um, get good exercise. We didn't mention this with insomnia, but there's actually now just published a, a really terrific study demonstrating that vigorous exercise is so good for sleep. Mm -hmm. um, so it, 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 what exercise does is it gives you the restorative, really good quality sleep that you're not getting in Parkinson's disease as well. Mm -hmm. And so I, I tell my patients, exercise every day hard enough so that you're sweating. Uh, mm -hmm. and your sleep quality will, will, that is probably the most effective thing we have for sleep quality. And that is, so it, obviously it, you'll, it'll affect insomnia as well, but it also should affect somnolence. And is there a timing of exercise? I've heard timing of exercise is important when you're trying to. Yeah. With... So if you have trouble falling asleep, you don't exercise at 8 p.m. Okay. Because when you exercise for 
somewhere between two hours and say up to six or seven hours, you may have difficulty falling asleep. And everybody's different. I mean, I can't exercise at eight, I'll be up till three. Other people can go to exercise at 10, fall straight asleep. So don't worry about it too much. If you're falling asleep, no problem, this is not an issue. Generally, we try to do the exercise during the day if possible. What about coffee? What about caffeine in general? Yeah. So uh, it's very obvious that coffee keeps everybody awake at some uh, level. And so we've actually done studies on coffee to see whether it helps. Um, it's, it's not that obvious. Uh, so what I think probably what coffee does is it's a nice, good short-term boost. To, if you're, so I'll often tell my patients, okay, you know you're always falling asleep at nine. You have to go for dinner. You wanna stay awake. Just have a coffee you know, at 6 p.m., okay? So you can stay awake for that dinner, that time, but you don't need to make a habit of having coffee every day at 6 p.m. to keep you awake. If you do it every day, it's not harmful to you, it's not harmful, it just stops working uh, as a wake uh, agent. Now, you can certainly drink coffee, I drink coffee every day, I like it, it keeps me alert, blah, 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 it's no problem, uh, but if you want to um, keep, make it keep you awake, uh, it's, it's the change, it's an extra coffee uh, or, or a coffee when you otherwise wouldn't have it, that'll probably help you during those few hours afterwards. And what about your doctor? Does your doctor have anything in his armamentarium that he can help you out with when it comes to right so there's a few medications there are some that are coming into clinical trials which i think are quite interesting and they're not available yet uh there's there's ritalin you know like the kids use for mm -hmm. attention deficit disorder uh that probably helps uh there's a medication called modafinil which uh we don't really know why it works <laughs> but it does help keep people awake okay there are some medications that will uh that we take at night to really drive people asleep. Um, the the uh, the, ga the the Xyrem is one of them. It it's so expensive and so difficult to use that practically speaking, I've I've used it once in my entire career, uh, mm -hmm. but it, it works. It, it's it's very difficult because it's the date rape drug. Uh, it's so it, you know, people. So it has lots of legal uh, medic you know, ramifications. Um, right. I hope I'm thinking of all of them. I've, I may have forgotten some. I must say that most of the time, medications for somnolence, I don't find particularly effective. And so what I'll often just tell people is, you know, maybe just schedule a couple of naps throughout the day rather than me adding another pill. Yeah, how do you feel about naps? That's a good question in terms of anyone with a sleep disorder or sleep disruption. Right, so if you have trouble falling asleep, then that's when you need to worry about your naps, okay? If you're not having trouble falling asleep generally, then you can worry a little bit less. Uh, if you are the sort of person who sleeps 14 hours a day, all right, uh, and you're sleeping well at night, then by all means, have your naps, it's fine. Try and schedule them and make, keep them short. Uh, so uh, do like other people do, uh, do like, you know, the executives do, you know, the, the classic business executive who sits and closes his door five minutes out and then up again. Uh, okay. You do get no, you don't get, uh, you lose your sleep drive, you release your sleep drive without getting sleep momentum, without getting sleepy throughout the day. So little cat naps throughout the day, if you're really sleepy, especially when they're planned, it's fine. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. It's okay. It's okay. Okay. That's yeah. good to know. Um, let's move on to... REM sleep disorder, because um, mm -hmm. uh, that's something that people have been asking about the acting out of dreams. Can you explain to everyone what REM sleep behavior disorder is exactly? Okay, so if you don't have Parkinson's, uh, and many of you don't have, who have Parkinson's as well, we have a normal system whose job it is, is when we dream to keep us paralyzed. So when you're dreaming, you're kind of in an almost wake state. It's sort of this uh, if you look on a sleep study, it almost looks like the person's awake, but you're having all these vivid and active dreams. And it's an important stage of your, of your sleep, probably for consolidation of memory and motor training, etc. But the system that is supposed to keep you paralyzed is affected in Parkinson's disease. Mm -hmm. uh, and so now you're capable of acting out your dreams. And so classically, this will be during the REM periods, which are usually later in the night. So, uh, you know, four in the morning, five in the morning, that sort of time. Uh, whatever you're dreaming is what you do. Now it's not walking, 
Uh, you can't walk during these episodes, uh, but it's usually thrashing around, talking, having a conversation, uh, everything, you know, everything that you're dreaming. So, you know, people smoking a cigarette or uh, singing a song, giving a lecture, and, and you're unaware of it if you're the patient yourself, unless you happen to wake yourself up. But if you sleep with someone, they'll tell you all about it. Um, and so it's, it's, it's uh, quite a, a funny sort of uh, interesting kind of problem. What's the danger of it though, if you're thrashing? Right, so the only danger of it, it doesn't really affect your sleep very much. Obviously you can wake yourself up if you're screaming uh, in the middle of the night from a nightmare, you can actually wake yourself up from your own screaming or you yeah, can punch the wall that. and that'll wake you up. But most of it, it's really safety is the only issue. Um, and so, uh, you know, if, especially if you're having intense agitated dreams, like you're fighting someone and you're sleeping next to someone and you're punching that person, you, you're really going to punch that person. Right. Uh, or falling out of bed. So one thing, you know, if you tried to get up and go to the bathroom because you had to pee and you lost your balance and you fell, that's okay. That's it. But if you fell out of bed and you don't know why, that's probably REM sleep behavior disorder. Uh, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Maybe once, maybe not. But if that's a repeated pattern of you, you're probably having a dream that you're running and then your legs start moving and you throw yourself out of bed, for example. Right. So that's the danger. Uh, so if you're doing it and it's and you tend to have nightmares, then you have to be pretty careful about uh, about what you do. And so many people sleep apart uh, so they don't hurt their spouse. Uh, keep sharp objects away from the bed. Uh, don't have a bed that's four feet high off the ground because that's a long fall. Um, mm -hmm. I, I often have patients who are concerned about what to do and, I, and, and they're concerned about its effect of sleep. And I say, well, if you want to cure it, and I put cure in quotation marks, it's not fixing the problem at all, but really you can manage the consequences of REM behavior sort of perfectly well if you have a mattress on the floor with no sharp objects, because the only consequence of REM sleep behavior disorder is injury. Right. Do certain medications aggravate it? Is it seen more in, with uh, the influence yeah. of sleep needs? Yeah, yeah. So the, the classic uh, group of medications that aggravate are the antidepressants. And basically almost every antidepressant can do it. Antidepressants have this side effect. It's, it's not a bad thing, actually. They're kind of motor activators. They activate your motor system directly. And so they're a very common trigger of, of more movement in the middle of the night. And so if you're on an antidepressant, you didn't really need it. And now you're acting out your dreams then maybe you can get rid of it. Other than the safety precautions, is there a treatment for RPD? Yeah. So the melatonin, I mentioned it earlier, that's what we usually do first because it's so safe, it's so easy to use. Uh, and we'll, I'll only do it if it's bothering a person or maybe a person has REM sleep behavior disorder and they're having a lot of insomnia and they're kind of sleepy during the day. Maybe I'll say, well, let's try and get two or three birds with one stone. So we'll use melatonin in that case. The one that really works is the one I mentioned earlier, clonazepam, uh, mm. but I really try not to use that because uh, it, it makes you sleepy during the day and therefore you're a little less cognitively alert and mm. actually also can increase risk of falls because you're sleepy as well. So I will definitely use it if, if the situation is dangerous and if it's not dangerous. I try, I try not to treat RB, the REM sleep behavior disorder in general, actually, if I can get away without it. Okay. But there, um, and I think this is an area of uh, interest for you. There's been studies that have shown that RBD can be a prodromal marker for Parkinson's disease. Can you explain what that means and what the studies have shown? Yeah, so, so it turns out that, so we think of Parkinson's disease as this motor disease, but uh, if you look at the way Parkinson's develops, it doesn't develop in the motor system at all. And so uh, most of the, we think that in most people, it's starting either in the olfactory areas or down in your, in your gut area. And then it kind of walks up your brain and it goes into the areas of the brainstem that are involved in regulation of your sleep and some of the mood issues as well. And then only really at, at, at these later stages does it get the motor system. Uh, now this is variable, everyone has a different, okay? Some people go straight to the motor system first, I think. Um, but the idea is that, therefore, it's targeting the sleep areas before it even targets the motor areas, mm -hmm. and especially this REM sleep behavior disorder. So uh, we now know that people who have REM sleep behavior disorder, now not just walk, sleepwalking, not just sleep talking, uh, but if you don't have Parkinson's yet, or, and, but you have REM sleep behavior disorder, you have Parkinson's. Uh, mm -hmm. And so 80 to 90% of people will end up getting either Parkinson's disease or the, the uh, 
what's called dementia with Lewy bodies, which is kind of a Parkinson's, Alzheimer's uh, combination. And almost everybody gets this. And it can be 10, 15, 20 years before. So many of you are on the chat now, or, or your spouses in particular goes, oh my goodness, he was doing that five years before the Parkinson's ever started. And we hear that all the time. Is there any um, marker that's as strong as that? For, yeah, for no, it's, it's by far the strongest. And so there, we, there's some suggestions that the other sleep disorders might be slight risk factors. So restless leg syndrome, not when you're 20 years old and restless legs, but if you start getting restless leg syndrome and you're 65 and you never had it before, that might be a slight risk factor, but it's kind of doubling your risk. Uh, mm -hmm. Excessive daytime somnolence, so people are falling asleep all of a sudden at the age of 50 and they never used to. Uh, mm -hmm. That's a risk factor for Parkinson's maybe, but kind of one and a half fold. Mm -hmm. uh, and insomnia might be, uh, we don't really know, but it probably will be on the order of one and a half or two fold. Uh, REMC behavior disorder is 50 or 100 fold, so it's really quite different. Yeah. And how is knowing that about REM sleep behavior disorder, how is that going to affect our research when it comes to looking for better treatments or Right. So this is a big area of research because, you know, realizing what, what I've just told you about how the Parkinson's spreads around the brain, that kind of means that you had Parkinson's in your brain maybe 10 or 15 years okay, before you ever actually presented with the disease, particularly those who are older. I think it's really like that. And we have all these great symptomatic treatments for Parkinson's, but you have nothing to slow down the underlying degenerative process of Parkinson's. Mm -hmm. uh, and We've been working very hard on getting that. Maybe one of the reasons is, is because, well, maybe it's too late. Uh, it's already been 15 years. If we could go back 15 years in time and catch you then, maybe some of these agents that have failed in the past uh, would, be, uh, would work if we would actually prevent Parkinson's from ever happening. So there's a lot of research on this, uh, on trying to find, you know, trying to get the trying to get ways to diagnose Parkinson's early, as early as possible, and then maybe some, try some of these, these drugs that are being developed in the early stages. So they're kind of being um, looked at in parallel, first finding the patients that would need the treatment that's trying to be developed, I guess, in that way. Yes, exactly. Yeah. So it's, yeah, there are treatments that are being developed and they're being tested. There's always a few going on. There's some that are quite interesting. The, the synuclein based uh, therapies are, are by far the most interesting, I think, for everyone who's in the field. Um, in other words, fixing the underlying protein. And there may be ways of getting that fixed now. Uh, and so these are, are in trials right now on Parkinson's. And now it's just trying to get the companies who have these products to try and get them to use them earlier and these people who don't have Parkinson's yet. And it's just, it's trying to get them as hard because these are, you know, it, these are multi-million dollar bets that they have to make every time. Right. Right. They do worry about, you know, whether it's going to work or not. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and the last category you mentioned earlier was the periodic leg movements or the, I guess most people call it legs. legs. Yeah. 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 So yeah. restless leg syndrome basically is um, as you're trying to fall asleep, generally, you feel that there's this hard to articulate discomfort in your, usually in your calves, sometimes elsewhere, and you kind of have to move. As soon as you're moving, it goes away. As soon as you stop moving, there it is again, this creepy, crawly, achy, unpleasant sort of uh, symptom that you get. Um, this is not seen very often in early Parkinson's disease, but we see it relatively often in later Parkinson's disease. Mm -hmm. It has a very strong ethnic predominance. So mm -hmm. Caucasians uh, get this by far more than just about any other ethnic group. Mm -hmm. uh, and it happens later in Parkinson's disease because you treat, so let's ignore Parkinson's completely, okay? So I, I, I have restless legs, I'm 30 years old. I treat it with the same dopamine agents that, I, that are used for Parkinson's disease, even though it has nothing to do with Parkinson's at all, but it happens to work. And if you, in fact, if you treat these people with dopamine agents around the clock, they start getting restless legs worse. Oh. And so what happens is this is a phenomenon called augmentation, that's the name. So what happened if you might've had the tendency towards restless legs, but you never had it? And now you got Parkinson's and we started treating your Parkinson's appropriately as we should, but this, this is around the clock dopamine therapy. And so now your restless legs that you barely noticed starts to become noticeable because we augmented your restless legs into existence. And so many people notice later on in the disease that this becomes a problem. So what do you do? 
it's hard to do much about it, to be honest. Um, there are a few medications. So, the, you know, you can treat with dopamine, but right, you need that for your Parkinson's. So you don't want to mess too much with your Parkinson's treatment, trying to get the restless legs under control. But clearly, if there's a hole at night, uh, you know, the same thing that I talked about insomnia, maybe you plug the hole with dopamine therapy. Right. There are a few other medications that one can use. What the, the gabapentin, the GABA medication, so it's pregabalin and gabapentin, that can help a little bit. Uh, but it's a tough one to deal with. Um, I, a lot of people notice it's worse in the summer, and so if they can keep their calves cool, just stick their legs out from under the covers, that often right. helps. Um, going for a bit of a walk can help, but it also can make you tired. So it, it's a tough one to, to do anything about, to be honest. So if you or your care partner suspect that you've got something going on with your sleep, um, what should be their next step? What, what do you recommend people do other than so, the hygiene stuff we talked about? Right. So, I mean, you, 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 so there, it's, it's difficult, right? Because they're, they're totally different problems. And so if you have insomnia, you should make sure you're getting a whole lot of exercise. Uh, don't stay in bed if you can't sleep. Uh, if you need medications, ask for them. Okay. If you have somnolence, watch out for those peaks. Uh, in the doses, is that the problem? Uh, are you uh, are are you snoring a whole lot? In other words, you had apnea all your life, and it's a coincidence. Uh, are you getting enough exercise? Are you getting enough light? If you have REM sleep behavior disorder, can you ignore it, or can you just live with it? And if you have restless leg syndrome, you know, you know, right. get get your exercise, treat your sleep as much as possible. Definitely talk with your physician about this. Um, uh, movement disorder specialists are generally getting pretty comfortable with these issues. You know, it's not just, we call ourselves movement disorders, but most people who really know how to treat Parkinson's are getting pretty good at treating all of the non-water aspects and like not just this, but the constipation and the, and the bladder dysfunction, everything else is massive list. And so most good Parkinson's specialists will have a couple of tricks up their sleeve as well. And what about sleep studies? Do they the studies on Yes. When you go for a sleep study, if your physician refers you for a sleep ah, study. Yes. Okay. So, uh, so what can, if it's not really clear what's going on with your sleep, sometimes they'll, they'll, your physician might order an overnight sleep study. Mm -hmm. In other words, measuring the way that you sleep. Mm -hmm. It's generally useful for REM sleep behavior disorder if you're uncertain. Although, to be honest, I almost never order it because if you give me a good symptom of REM sleep behavior disorder and you have Parkinson's, it, it, we're almost never wrong because um, it, it's so common in Parkinson's. Uh, it can be good if you think you might have had apnea all along. Most of the time, a, an overnight sleep study is not really required. Most of the time, we just see, oh, yeah, you got Parkinson's. Your sleep looks like a total mess, which it does, uh, you, unfortunately. <laughs> it's very, you know, like I said, the, the sleep systems are deregulated, and so often there's a lot of wakefulness, a lot of, you know, stages are are, are, are unstable, etc. But there's not much actionable on that. So most of the time, I don't order sleep studies. I, I'm a sleep specialist. I, I do sleep, and it's very rare that I actually order one. I've often wondered how it even makes sense when you're in such an artificial environment that you could actually... Yes. Yeah, yeah. It, you can't do it for insomnia. So the classic of, of insomniac patients is, you know, as soon as they get in the sleep lab, oh my goodness, they, they have a 10 hour beautiful night, right? Because they've taken away the associate, they're no longer in that horrible torture chamber bed, they're in a, a different bed and they sleep fantastically. So yeah, it, it's useless for insomnia, a sleep study. So there's a few questions that have been um, coming through the chat and a couple of them are about THC and CBD for sleep. Mm -hmm. And so, what we that. don't have good studies. Uh, it's so difficult to study CBD. We've been trying for years and, and paradoxically the legalization that we have in Canada has made it worse because now everyone can just go get it and but getting you know a stable supplier is almost impossible. We really don't have good science on what CBD does uh, for sleep. Mm -hmm. um, anecdotally, okay, and only I know from talking to my patients, like I said, it's legal in Canada so everyone just mm -hmm. go and get it. Um, people do find often that it, it does, it, it, it can help insomnia, uh, and particularly the, the little bit more CBD rather than the, the THC uh, can cause hallucinations, right? And that's a big problem in Parkinson's disease, but the mm -hmm. CBD predominant preparations are probably relatively safe. Um, I, I have no real science to, to back that up, but they're probably relatively safe. They have, my patients do notice that it, insomnia is a big issue. It can help that. Some people with REM sleep behavior said they're a bit better. It's not going to help somnolence, right? Because that's, in fact, 
that's what it's doing. And it, it's a CBD at night. Uh, it's, you know, for anxiety, discomfort, sleep, I think it probably helps. But again, don't quote me on that because it's not been studied properly, unfortunately. What if someone's on Duopa? Duodopa. Yes, Duodopa. Yeah. So Duodopa is, so for those of you who don't know, it's, it's a pump that provides levodopa into the small intestine directly. And it keeps people, keeps the levels of levodopa safe, uh, sorry, safe, stable throughout the day. Most of the time, uh, people unhook their duodopa at night. And so you may find that your sleep gets worse because of all the things I just talked about, right? You, mm -hmm. And uh, so maybe uh, in many cases when that happens, we're using uh, the, if not the duodopa, then maybe a Cinemet CR, a control release, or just regular Cinemet throughout the night to help you sleep. So if you're taking off the duodopa and then you can't sleep, you may need Cinemet throughout the day. Sorry, throughout the night. Throughout the night. Um, and cognitive behavioral therapy, you mentioned it when you were talking about sleep hygiene, but is there a role for formal cognitive behavioral therapy for patients? Uh, well, we did a little study of it. But again, it was a very small number of people. It, it did appear to be useful uh, when, when we did it. There haven't been pretty good studies. It, it is the primary therapy for insomnia in the general population. If you can't fall asleep, uh, I think it's probably something to, be, to, to use. If you can't stay asleep, I can't tell you it's going to work, uh, mm -hmm. but you certainly can try it. Um, you can get online CBT now. Uh, there's a few companies that run these things. It's like $200 or something like this. So it's not that expensive, really, if you compare that to all the medications that you'd be taking all this time. Um, and, and it's certainly worth the shot. Um, but yeah, again, the studies on CBT in, uh, in, uh, in Parkinson's are relatively limited. Okay, so we're getting sort of towards the end of our time, but I really want to ask you, um, are there any clinical trials underway that we should be looking for that are showing promise for a drug or treatment that will help with sleep disorder? Anything coming down the yeah, pipeline? There's a few. Yeah, there's a few. There's, there's one thing that's got me kind of interesting is this class of medications that deal with orexin or hypocretin. This is the uh, this is the famous uh, uh, abnormal uh, neurotransmitter of, of uh, narcolepsy. And people mm -hmm. with narcolepsy have this thing where they fall asleep all the time during the day and they have unstable sleep at night. And so they're flipping in and out of their sleep stages at night and they're falling asleep all the time during the day. And I, I spent some time reading sleep studies and I would read some Parkinson's sleep studies and I go, boy, that sure looks like a narcoleptic sort of a sleep pattern. And people have de thought that there's a bit of a narcoleptic type of sleep pattern in Parkinson's disease. Again, maybe related to degeneration of these sleep regions. And so these are being studied right now. I'm finding that quite interesting. I think there's ongoing studies of, of there's some CBT studies that are ongoing. There are some exercise studies that are still ongoing. Uh, there's a few other drugs. I can't, I, I can't list them off the top of my head, but you know, it is an area that pharmaceutical companies are interested in, in dealing with. So, you know, you'll, you'll see them come up. Keep your eyes. There's, open. Hope. <laughs> there's hope. That's good. And your own research, Dr. Pistuma, do you want to mention anything that you are working on right now that is interesting? Yeah. Yeah, right now I'm working. So what I've really pivoted to doing most of my time spending is, is working with these REM sleep behavior disorder patients, uh, trying now to really figure out who's going to get Parkinson's, who isn't going to get Parkinson's, uh, or when they're going to get Parkinson's, and trying to get the, these, these agents in clinical trials. That, that's really what I want to be spending my time on uh, as much right. as possible from now on. And one last question from the audience that they really would like addressed, that's DBS and sleep. Is there a right. problem? Uh, yeah, and so DBS probably helps sleep um, most of the time, okay? Now it depends a little bit on where exactly those leads are, uh, but it, it's exactly analogous, just like you wanna fix the dopamine therapy at night because that's what's causing insomnia. DBS is, it's just electric cinnamon. It's, it's not really doing anything very different than the levodopa does. It's just doing it with a battery, right? Mm -hmm. And so most of the time there is improvement in the sleep when you use DBS or any continuous dopaminergic or 
uh, treatment during the night should help out on average. Now, one of the complications is that sometimes the DBS electrodes aren't quite in the right place. Some people get a little impulsive, for example, or can have judgment difficulties if, if, it's, if, if, if the lead is, is what we call too ventral. And then, of course, your sleep can be completely screwed up because you're eating all night or, or things like this. But most of the time, if it's a good DBS procedure, your sleep should improve a little bit. Well, that's good to know. Any, anything else you want to say about how important sleep is for a patient self-care routine? Any other parting words of advice? Yeah, so if you have to do one thing, get exercise. Um, if you're having trouble sleeping, you should be tired from exercise, out of breath and sweaty once a day. Whatever it is, there's no magic exercise, but try and find it. Your, your quality of sleep will improve. You should be less sleepy as well during the day. Um, that's the one thing I would tell you that you can do yourself right now. It seems, it's so interesting. All problems seem to lead down to that one thing that we all seem to hate to do, which is <laughs> exercise. <laughs> but you're absolutely right. So thank you so much, Dr. Fatsuma, for, um, Fatsuma, for everything, your expertise and your advice. It's so greatly appreciated. Um, we can't thank you enough for that. And thank you everyone for joining us today. And I hope you found your time with us helpful and educational. Well, I'll be sending you a link. I know there's some questions about um, this uh, talk being available afterwards and we will send you a link so you can share the webinar with other people. And um, always remember, I, I say this sort of at every end of every webinar, but we don't have control over our diagnosis, but how we face the challenges that this disease brings into our lives really is our to ours to determine. So focus on optimizing your quality of life, educate yourself, empower yourself, and also celebrate your daily victories. Thank you very much. Thank you.